Thanks, Shimhan. Um, hi, guys. Uh, I'm going to be giving, making my arguments for the petitioner once the round starts. But um, before we go there, I'm going to give you a short like summary of what this particular problem is about. It should be relatively easy to follow because it's based on the COVID situation. So you're likely going to be acquainted with a lot of the facts um, that Janay and I will subsequently give the judges. So um, what I'm going to do is I'll briefly tell you about the problem. Then I will cover the general format of a moot round. And then if like you have any, I can cover the law briefly and then you, we can head to the actual round. So um, in this problem, particularly uh, one, we're looking at one metropolitan city where there's been an outbreak of Captain Kuhn's disease, which is effectively a respiratory disorder. It's been heightened to the status of a pandemic. And obviously there are concerns about it spreading and uh, effectively contaminating the entire city and the entire state as a result. So there are two um, aspects to this problem that are particularly relevant. The first is in order to control the public and to ensure that there is just no general public disorder, the Deputy Commissioner of Police has promulgated an order under Section 144 of the CRPC. Um, Section 144 of the CRPC is also something that has been constantly um, promulgated during the course of the COVID pandemic in general. Effectively, it prohibits the assembly of five or more people at a given point in time. It also, it's effectively a preventive emergency order, which allows the police to control the situation at hand. Uh, this particular order has been promulgated. There are also specific, um, of, there are also specific directions that the order gives and what, what generally section 144 orders are allowed to do. For the purposes of this problem, the relevant bits are that this order prohibits the dissemination of information or of any derogatory comments towards a particular set, and it prohibits the causing of any panic or confusion or mistrust towards the government. Now, all of these points become relevant in the course of the arguments, as you will see, because one side will argue that this order is too broad and it violates the fundamental rights of the citizens. And the other side will argue that it is not overbroad and it is in fact necessary in a pandemic, which is essentially a time of crisis. Having said that, let's look at fundamental rights itself. Uh, we're going to be looking at Article 19.1 which deals with the freedom of speech and expression in the Constitution of India. Now, um, as a general rule, all fundamental rights can be curtailed by reasonable restrictions that are enumerated in Article 19 itself. Fundamental rights under 19.1 are curtailed by 19.2. As a result, um, the second sort of argument that will be put to consideration is whether this particular order violates Article 19.1 or whether it constitutes to be a reasonable restriction under 19.2 of the Constitution. Uh, that's the brief overview of the problem. These are the two provisions of law that you'd necessarily require. So if you guys want to pull up the provisions in front of you while we're arguing, that would be good. Um, this Second thing is that uh, this particular um, problem is, has, is effectively a PIL or a public interest litigation before the High Court. Um, so under the Constitution of India, the provisions that govern PIL litigation will be Articles 226 and 227, if anybody wants to look at that. Um, that's pretty much what the problem is. Um, as far as the format is concerned, it's usually the petitioner who goes first. So I will be speaking first. Then Jane, the respondent, will be representing the state. So he will go second. He will make a full set of submissions for 10 minutes. And then I will come back for two minutes to offer my rebuttals on his arguments. So that's usually the format. I think that's the format that you guys will follow as well. 
Um, and that's pretty much it. In case anyone has any questions, like feel free to ask. Thanks, Priyanshi. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, we'll just be waiting for Janya to join and then we can begin with the round itself. Thank you.
Oh, hi. So I think Jan has also joined. So we can begin with the round now, if that's okay. Sorry, sorry for the delay. I, I, I just got my bad. No worries. Thank you so much for doing this. It's such short notice. Where are judges? Uh, Shivali and Masira. Hi. Hi. Hey, Jan. Hi, hi Shivali, how are you? All good. All well with the pandemic. Yes, I hope the same with you. Yeah. Hi, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I got tested negative right now, in fact. So <laughs> good. Good. <laughs> that's always a good thing to you. Hi, Missy, how are you? Hi, how are you? I think I saw you in court, didn't I? <clears throat> Am I audible? Yeah, yeah I think Jana is like frozen. He's facing some technical issue. Also, sorry, I'm getting like a few questions on chat about like uh, general instructions about like how to moot and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, like, is this like are these questions that we can answer like post round? Yeah. Yeah, so like once they see the round, once they see yeah, it, that they sense. have like specific questions. That's the whole purpose of yeah. the mood, right? Like we're watching you live, like we're watching you mood right now. So uh, I think it would clear some doubts. And if there yeah. are some remaining, which you feel have gone unanswered in yeah. the chat box, then we can address those. Has Janel logged out? Uh, yeah, yeah, I so think Janet. he's just trying to rejoin right now. Yeah.
or oh, hi am i audible visible everything is fine yeah sorry okay should i start yes uh rohan will you uh, keep time yeah oh uh, yeah i'll keep time okay great thank you so much just a minute uh, are you going to be screen sharing or is the committee screen sharing i don't like need any like i don't need to screen share at all unless will you, will you be will you be pointing out at paragraphs from the mood problem um yeah mood problem i can um take you to the relevant paragraphs but i only uh... so if someone can just screen share that Okay. and just keep it you don't have to because you'll be arguing if someone from the committee could just screen share it so whatever yeah. paragraph she points out saying i get your attention to 12 then you can just scroll okay. so someone from the committee could do that yeah okay right just just give us one minute we'll just ask someone to do that and then we can start yeah no worries take your time Um so Abhishek will be screen sharing the prop as and when it's referred to so you can actually can start Thank you Good morning your ladyships I am counsel Priyanshi Vakharia appearing on behalf of the petitioner in the present public interest litigation proceedings before the honorable court today The present PIL concerns the constitutional validity of an order promulgated under section 144 of the Criminal Procedure Code which effectively prohibits citizens of the state from doing four particular activities which the honorable court will find on page 9 of the moot proposition I refer specifically to paragraph 4 therein where the prohibited activities are as follows Firstly prohibition of disseminating any information on social media which is found to be incorrect or distorting facts secondly which information is derogatory or discriminatory towards any one particular community thirdly which is likely to cause panic and confusion among the general public and fourthly which incites mistrust towards government functionaries the petitioner is challenging this order on three grounds firstly that it is arbitrary and vague secondly that it is malified and thirdly that it is disproportionate and in that respect cannot qualify to be a reasonable restriction under article 192 of the constitution of india which allows restrictions on the fundamental freedom of speech and expression guaranteed under article 191 consequently honorable judges if i may address my submissions in this particular order i would like to begin with the very first leg first which is that the impugned order is arbitrary and vague uh do your ladyships have any objections or may i no please proceed thank you your ladyship your ladyship says submit that this impugned order is arbitrary and vague because it has no proximate and direct nexus with the objective of curtailing the spread of captain coon's disease which is the pandemic and the global health crisis that the police force is seeking to protect its citizens against I refer to the judgment of S Rangarajan versus P Jagjivan Ram in which the Supreme Court noted that four restrictions that are necessitated and the anticipated danger that such restrictions seek to protect must not be remote conjectural or far fetched and in that sense they should have a proximate and direct nexus with the expression that the executive measures seek to protect in the present case i submit that the wording that in here if i may direct the honorable court's attention to specifically sub clauses 1 3 and 4 of paragraph 4 which effectively deal with disseminating information that distorts facts 
information which causes panic and confusion among the public and information which incites mistrust against the government. These are very broad terms and they are in fact arbitrary because there is no proximate or direct nexus that the police, that the deputy commissioner has justified in the course of his order. I also would like to draw the attention of the court to the case of Shreya Singhal versus Union of India, wherein the Supreme Court effectively recognized three stages of the freedom of speech and expression. The first is discussion, the second is advocacy, and the third is incitement. This is particularly relevant, your ladyships, because the reasonable restrictions under Article 19.2 only really kick in when the discussion or advocacy stage reaches incitement. In the course of the present order, it is impossible for the uh, deputy commissioners or for any executing authorities at all to really make a distinction as to when mere discussion or advocacy becomes incitement. I submit before your ladyships, my, the second limb of my argument, that the impugned order is malified. And the reason I say so is because it has been promulgated with the ulterior objective of restricting speech and expression entirely. Here, your ladyships, I would like to address the second subclause of paragraph four, which is the prohibition of information that is derogatory and discriminatory towards a particular community. In my respectful submission, your ladyships, the only justifiable concern that could have necessitated the promulgation of this order was the fact that communal tensions were rife on social media. And this is evident from paragraph eight of the moot proposition. I submit two particular arguments in this regard. Firstly, that this could have also been tackled by taking recourse to specific provisions concerning hate speech under the Indian Penal Code, necessarily being sections 295A, 153A, sections 153B1C, which are all outlined with the objective of preventing the dissemination of derogatory remarks or remarks of such color towards a particular community. However, the order, I would also like to draw the Honorable Court's attention to the fact that this particular order was not promulgated until the 23rd of May, 2020. And this is particularly relevant considering that the communal tensions that should have raised the concern of the Deputy Commissioner had already arisen towards the end of March and the beginning of April. If I may take the Honorable Court to a few paragraphs previously, uh, I refer specifically to paragraph nine, which the Honorable Court will find on page three of the moot proposition. The first positive case in the slums of Ringo was found on 1st April 2020, where the patient was a follower of the religion of Tarantino, Tarantino being a minority religion, which has often been the subject of discrimination. As a result, more, almost two months have passed since there has been discrimination against a particular religious sect, since communal tensions have arisen. And yet the deputy commissioner has not thought it fit to promulgate an order any time earlier. As a consequence, your ladyships, we submit that this order has been passed with malified intent with some ulterior objective. And in this case, if I may invite the attention of the Honorable Court to the case of Ram Manohar Loya versus State of Bihar, wherein the Supreme Court laid down that courts have always acted with the objective of restraining a misuse of statutory power more readily when improper objectives were underlying such action. With this, your ladyships, I'd like to move to my third and final limb, that of disproportionality, for which I refer to the most recent exposition of the proportionality standard, as has been set forth in the 2020 case of Anuradha Basin versus Union of India. In Anuradha Basin, effectively, there were four prongs of the proportionality standard that were promulgated. 
in order to ensure that a particular action falls within the ambit of reasonable restrictions under Article 19.2. Firstly, that there must that the goal of the measure in restricting fundamental rights must be in pursuance of a legitimate state aim. Secondly, there must be the existence of alternate mechanisms. And second, and thirdly, that it must be the least possible restrictive measure to be taken. And fourthly, there must be sufficient material to support the executive measure, and such measure must be amenable to judicial review. Very briefly, since I'm almost out of time, your ladyships, I submit that these four prongs have not been fulfilled. Firstly, subparagraphs one, three, and four of paragraph four of the impugned order do not meet the legitimate state aim of preserving public order in a pandemic because there is no proximate or direct. Council, yes. If I may ask you a yes, question, sorry. the objective of this order is to. Uh, reduce communal tension because now this virus has been given a color of religion yes for for those reasons it's very obvious that this can raise tension and for this reason as a precautionary measure it is in my view absolutely necessary to take steps in a way that will reduce such tensions so there is a clear view and there is and this is the most restrictive this is the least restrictive step that could be taken your ladyship if i may i'm sorry your ladyship um, have you concluded your question i'm sorry yes so I'm... in that sense it fulfills the criteria that has been raised the four object the four tests that you have laid down from anuradha basin uh, in that sense how in what way would you say that it still does not yes. uh, fulfill the test. Thank you for your question, Your Ladyship. If I may just, uh, since I'm out of time, if I may just take about 30 seconds to answer your question and then conclude my submission. Sure. Thank you, Your Ladyship. Your Ladyship, I respectfully submit that this is not the least restrictive measure that would have been taken. Firstly, because the impugned order was enacted almost two months after communal tensions first arose, indicating that the necessity of the measure itself is liable to be questioned. Secondly, your leadership, notwithstanding the timeline, there is absolutely no need for the impugned order to be so wide. I completely understand that the state has a, and I appreciate that the state has the responsibility to prevent communal tensions. And if this particular order was only restricted to paragraph four, subpart two, I may not have raised this particular PIL in the first case, but the fact remains that sub paragraphs one, three, and four are equally disturbing and are designed to curtail the rights of the citizens. And for these reasons, the impugned order must be struck down as ultra virus or must be partially struck down as ultra virus, keeping in mind the police power under four sub paragraph two. If the Honorable Court has no further questions, I would like to rest my submissions. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, may I begin? Yes, Counsel. May it please this court. I'm counsel appearing on behalf of the state of Binoki in the present matter. And I will be making three submissions. Firstly, that the present petition in itself is infructuous. Second, alternatively, even if the court were to consider this petition to still be holding of some fundamental right violations, it, it does not fall under the prongs of Article 14 and secondly, Article 19. Firstly, under Section 144 of the CRPC, any order under section 144 shall only remain in force for a period of two months. Herein we see on page four, paragraph 10 of the mood proposition that this order in itself was issued on the 23rd of May, 2020. And the two months have ended on 23rd July, 2020 itself. Therefore we see that in the present proceedings, this petition, this 144 order in itself has elapsed. And therefore the petition raised by my learned friend is now infructuous. I would like to draw this court's attention to a judgment of the Bombay High Court in the case of Gita Seshu 
versus the commissioner of police and another. This was a case which came up in the pandemic itself in 2020, pertaining to an order under section 144. Herein, that order was for a period of 15 days. And irrespective that as it had elapsed, the court stated that as the order has come to an end, the petition was dismissed, reasoning that there was no subject matter in the petition left. However, alternatively, I will still be dealing with the arguments raised by my learned friend, first on the prong of Article 14, and second on the prong of Article 19. Herein, my argument is based on the famous line that it is the falsehood that flies and it is the truth that comes limping after it, unfortunately. Herein, I will be dealing with my Article 14 challenge on the grounds of arbitrariness. In the well-reported judgment of Anuj Garg versus the Hotel Association of India, it was stated that an arbitrary action is one that is irrational and not based on sound reason. And it is my submission to this honorable court that the impugned order is not in fact arbitrary, but has been passed under section 144 of the CRPC. And in the Supreme Court judgment of Praveen Bhai Togadia, it was stated that interference is not the rule, but merely an exception under section 144 of the CRPC. Herein, I would like to demonstrate to this court some factors as to why this case was brought in. Firstly, this 144 order has been brought up in the city of Yolanda. My lady must appreciate that Yolanda is the largest city in this country and it possesses the population of the highest number in the DRC. Secondly, it also has the largest slum in the world, which is Ringo. And moreover, today we are faced with a disease which is based on human contact. And it is in this light, as we see in the moot proposition, that there was a virtual campaign of hate unleashed on social media, as my lady had rightly pointed out. We see on page three, paragraph eight of the moot proposition, that infected cases across the country were on the rise. And this was attributable, unfortunately, to a religious gathering of members of the Tarantino sect. Now we must understand that this Tarantino sect is unlike any other, and unfortunately and most deplorably, it has faced a history of discrimination in this country itself. And secondly, we see that it was not merely the fact that they were discriminated across, but most importantly, on page three, paragraph nine of the proposition, a person who lived in the slums of Ringo and was a follower of the Tarantino sect, in fact, tested positive, and therefore a campaign of virtual hate was unleashed. Now, my lady, these were early days of the pandemic in this country, and there were not many measures as to how is to be dealt with. Fortunately, we have come to a better place a year later, where we have definitely seen what has worked and what hasn't. And this is something the court must keep in mind while challenging or while deciding the legality of this CRPC order. Secondly, my learned friend referred to the case of Shreya Singhal versus the Union of India. And therein, the court had made a very pertinent observation that something posted on a site or a website is something that can travel like lightning to millions of people over the world. Now, apart from the communal tension, there was one more instance which I would like to point out through this fact sheet which brings in the reason or the rationale for putting in this order. If I would like to draw the bench's attention to page four, paragraph 11 of the proposition. If my lords are with me. Yes. Social media played a significant role to spread misinformation. One such rumor led to migrant laborers congregating at a railway station in Yolanda. As trains and buses had been suspended, the workers were stuck in camps and they placed reliance on such rumors and congregated in thousands. And it was owing to this order where such misinformation was reported by the admins to the police. They were quickly dispersed by the Yolandan police. Now, my lady, the reasoning when we look at this order is not merely, let's say there's communal tension or there is misinformation or the pandemic. It is all these factors which come in as a whole and this justifies the reasoning for the order. Which brings me to my next step as to the content of the order and what is in it itself. And this brings me to the famous test laid down by the Supreme Court in Modern Dental College, which was followed by the Aadhaar judgment, which was also followed by Anuradha Basin, which is the cornerstone of the test proportionality. And the question which arises here is whether there exists a lesser restrictive alternative remedy. 
Now, let me apprise my lady of multiple remedies governments have taken in this country to deal with the flow of misinformation on social media and then prove as to why this order under Section 144 CRPC is in fact the least restrictive remedy. And if I can really step my argument further and say is actually benevolent of the government in this times of a pandemic where communal hate and misinformation were rampant. Now, my lords, my ladies must be well apprised of suspension rules under Section 7 of the Telegraph Act, wherein suspension of telecom services as a whole is taken place, which we saw in Kashmir in, 20 to, in 2019. This would have been the most restrictive measure. We have not done that. Secondly, under Section 69 of the Information Technology Act, we see that we can... Uh, do I see uh, any questions at this point? Yeah, uh, right. I, I have a question. Uh, there is an inherent right yes. against hate speech, right? What is, we understand that there was communal tension at that stage. Firstly, it's the petitioner's argument that you were too late in reacting to that communal hate and that your measures have come way too far in the future. Secondly, isn't there an inherent right already under section article 19 and whether this would be necessary because there are rights against hate speech right so whether in addition to that these impugned orders were necessary in the sense it shows a color that the state didn't want any criticism towards itself rather than reducing communal tension i harbor my lady's concern and for this i would like to take you to the order itself wherein it is stated that this is punishable under Section 188 of the Indian Penal Code. Now, Section 188 of the Indian Penal Code is an offence which is bailable in its entirety, and it is a non-cognizable offence. And therefore, we see that there is no question of stifling political criticism. In fact, the provisions of hate speech under IPC Section 295A will be applicable. Moreover, this is an additional remedy. And herein we have seen that Section 144 orders can be construed to be in the form of a lex specialis. And therefore, it is in cumulation to the Indian Penal Code offences. And it is merely brought to deal with these unfortunate and unpredictable circumstances. And this brings me to my argument regarding what my lady raised regarding our delay in raising this order. We could have raised this order earlier, but then the petitioners would have come to court and stated that, look, there is no nexus behind this order and therefore this arbitrary action is irrational. In this case, we will be damned to do something and we will be damned to not do something. And therefore, these are decisions of the executive. And therefore, the question which lies is that whether interference in section one falls is not the rule, but merely an exception. And with this, as I see that I merely have two minutes remaining, I will be completing my argument as to how this is the least restrictive remedy. I had apprised my lady first about section seven of the Telegraph Act. Secondly, about section 69A. What we have done in this scenario is we have not blocked access to any particular website. We have not suspended telecom services. On the contrary, all we have done is we have blocked certain aspects on certain social media websites, which have been turned in later is courses. It, Council, is it your argument that we could have done worse, but we've stuck to doing uh, a little better, like we have the power to do much worse, and I don't think citing the Kashmir case is a very mm. good example in this situation. Uh, it's an argument against you. So is that your argument that we have more powers, but we've curtailed them and that's how good we are? My lady, our argument today is that today the state has multiple remedies. And the test of proportionality states that we must choose the least restrictive remedy. And herein we see that we have taken with all the remedies available under the law, as I have demonstrated dealing with social media and internet services, we have taken the least restrictive remedy. And therefore, this is a proportional order. Moreover, had this been there for infinite or for an infinite nature, one could have considered this to be unreasonable. However, this is merely for a period of two months and the time has now elapsed. Lastly, my learned friend contended the very fact that the wordings were vague and it relied on Shriya Singhal versus Union of India. However, Shreya Singhal made two pertinent observations. Firstly, it stated that the legislature may well provide for separate offenses for so far as free speech over internet is concerned. And the differentiation given here, which deals with the vagueness is that unlike television media, 
or other forms of news media it is a one way communication but social media in itself is a two way communication where it's much faster to spread misinformation and secondly even if i were to take my learned friend's best case argument pertaining to the wordings being vague there was a very interesting case of zameer ahmad latif ur rahman sheikh versus the state of maharashtra where the term expression insurgency was left undefined and there in the supreme court accorded meaning in accordance with the intention of the legislature similarly my learned friend relied upon hate speech on the ipc and even if this court were to deem certain words to be vague they can certainly be read with ipc offenses which i can certainly demonstrate to the court however as i see that my time has now elapsed i would like to conclude my submissions with a simple prayer that this petition in itself must be dismissed because it is infructuous and it is merely at best to say an academic discussion because the contents of the order are not in force anymore and secondly even if the court were to decide this argument we have not reached article 14 and article 19 as these were desperate times and therefore we must be excused counsel i have a question uh, with respect to section 144 being an emergent and also a preventative mechanism which has been adopted by the state at many times i'm coming back to the petitioner council's point with respect to the delay if at all of 2 months almost uh, in reacting to the communal violence the order correlates the communal um, hatred to a possible rise in the cases are there any facts which you would like to present to the bench with respect to a rise in cases around the time of may which led you all to pass the order or was that simply a delay on your part and what would your reasoning be for that delay is the first question and i would also like to pose the second question so that you can handle both is with respect to the um, restrictions which you all have placed on the admins under section 144 which you've mentioned do you think it is just to impose a vicarious liability on the admins for any kind of comments and speech which comes under their posts and is it not as per your understanding the liability of the platform which is used rather than that has there been any differentiation in what social media platforms how an admin of different social media platforms would work uh firstly thank you for the questions i'll be dealing with them very briefly as i see yes. that the bench has been more than generous according me time on paragraph 9 it has been stated that a campaign of virtual hate was once again unleashed against members of the tarantino and paragraph 10 we see that apprehending real communal clashes now here in the details as to how long the campaign has been stated for have not been given and therefore it will be an assumption on either side of the moot proposition to decide how long the campaign was for and the accordance of the order rather we see that it is not merely one campaign but it is a cumulative factors where we look at the accordance and the demographic of the city we are dealing with it's not as if this order has been bought in the entire country at large however in a virus which spreads through human to human transmission in the largest city to curb misinformation on social media therefore i would like this is how i would like to answer the first question and secondly when it comes to admins under the information technology act we see there is a safe harbor provision which is accorded to intermediaries if they comply with certain guidelines and therefore we would be shooting ourselves in the foot if we were to call these social media intermediaries liable if they have itself accorded these actions moreover that would be the action of the central government and this is an action brought by the police commissioner of the state government and in the case of babulal parate it was stated that the police commissioner is well within its force to, to bring in an order under section 144 crpc secondly we see the question about admins however the main aim of this order was to serve as a deterrent to providing misinformation in a pandemic and this is very well apparent as we have seen that this is under section 188 of the indian penal code now section 188 of the indian penal code is a non cognizable offence which is available as a very inherent therefore it is merely a deterrent and we can see that once the order was passed there were fewer and fewer instances of something like this coming to the fore and it was merely because of this order i would like to draw it i would conclude my submissions but very pertinently i would like to draw this court's attention to paragraph 11 where they stated that despite because of the rumor that had spread in that in the bus stop it was only because of the admins coming to the light could this issue have been reasonably solved and therefore it is this order was well within its force 
with the intention of the legislature. Thank you, Council. Obliged. Council, before you proceed, Priyanshi, I also want you to answer this question, whether what are your prayers and whether you can uh, seek these prayers under Article 226 and you've mentioned even under Article 227. Yes. So after you've done dealing with uh, the respondents' issues, right. you can also deal with this question. Right. Thank you, Your Ladyship. Uh, if I may very briefly address my learned friend's concerns. Firstly, uh, I understand that the impugned order itself has elapsed by way of the two month timeline as prescribed in subsection four of section 144. But if I may submit for the consideration of the honorable court, the case of state of Bihar versus KK Mishra, which decided exactly this point and said that if the wires of an order is being challenged, whether or not that particular order has elapsed due to an efflux of time is irrelevant and will not constitute a bar on any proceedings thereafter, and that such order is still liable for scrutiny under part three of the Constitution of India. Therefore, for the purposes of maintainability of this PIL, it does not matter that the impugned order lapsed on 23rd of July, it is permissible for this court to consider its constitutional validity. My learned friend also referred to the case of Gita Seshu, wherein the Bombay High Court effectively rendered a judgment in, in the context of social media administrators. And this is particularly relevant, your ladyships, for two reasons. Firstly, that the reason the Bombay High Court disposed of those PILs was because the order itself had expired and that had nothing to do with the actual validity of the contents of the order itself. Secondly, your ladyships, that particular, um, the Bombay High Court's judgment in Gita Seshu was rendered on 10th July 2020, immediately after the order itself was promulgated on 23rd May 2020. So before the two month timeline really elapsed as per subsection four. For these reasons, the judgment of Gita Seshu will not have any persuasive value before this particular court. I understand that my learned friend also addressed certain submissions on arbitrariness under article 14. But if I may just clarify that the petitioner in this regard has not made any submissions on the right to equality under Article 14, we simply submit that the impugned order contravenes Article 19, which is the right of freedom of speech and expression. Therefore, any arbitrariness that any arbitrariness that falls from the order under Article 19 is liable to be restricted by 19.2 if it fulfills the proportionality standard. Now in defending the proportionality standard, my learned friend submitted that this was in fact the least restrictive measure and that the sections of the IPC could be read along with the provisions of the impugned order. To which my simple rebuttal, your ladyships, is that the mere fact that an offense is bailable and non-cognizable is not sufficient to wrongly imprison individuals when the order itself is submitted to be vague, arbitrary, and made with malified intent. With this, your ladyships, if I may address your question, briefly the petitioners, and I understand we are at a preliminary stage in making submissions. Therefore, I submit that for the purposes of this proceeding, the Honorable Court will have the jurisdiction to hear and entertain the present PIL. Your ladyships, I see that I'm out of time. So if I may just have 15 seconds to answer no. the question. Thank you. And therefore, as a result, this petitioner prays that this particular PIL be taken up by the Honorable Court and that either the impugned order be struck down as being ultra virus or those portions of the impugned order that the court finds to be ultra virus are, stuck, are struck down, leaving enough for the police commissioners to execute 
their constitutional duties. These prayers have been made under the jurisdiction of Article 226, which allows the High Court's writ jurisdiction. And as a result, the petitioners would like to conclude their prayer. Which writ are you seeking for? Um, your ladyship, this would be a writ of prohibition because effectively you would be prohibiting the uh, deputy commissioner of police from undertaking certain actions. Okay. Thank you, your ladyships. Thank you for giving me a very patient hearing. Thank you, counsel. Wait, do I get a rebuttal? No, I think we stop at rebuttal and not sorry rebuttal. It's just going to go on forever. Yeah. If that All right, thank you so my much. Poor judge. Is that fine? Should we stop at rebuttal? I think we should stop at rebuttal. Okay. And uh, we can yeah. let them know that in general, sometimes the bench allows a sorry rebuttal. Yes. However, that's not procedural. Thank you, right. um, for your argument. If the juniors have any questions, um, y'all can put them in the chat box now. And um, yeah. Um, also, if any of y'all have received any questions on a private chat, y'all can answer that. Yeah, also. I was just going to say that. Priyanshi, you received a couple of questions with respect to moting, right? Like, have they all been answered, you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, should I just, like, go in order, like, of how I received them? Because I haven't, like, replied to them. Yeah, so you can, you, why don't you review them and see if anything yeah. needs to be answered? Uh, yeah. And then we can address that. And I see questions starting. So, Ruhan, I think you can start reading them out and then... Okay, great. So, uh, Priyanshi, do you want to start with your questions or should I start with these ones first? No, you start reading them. Um, okay, fine. Start reading them. I'm sure like they'll pop up because I already okay. see a couple of similar ones. Okay, so the first one is if we're referring to any case, do we share them with you beforehand? So I'm guessing this is with reference to the name of the cases more than anything. Okay, so the way it usually works is that... Um, and again, Jana and I could have different perspectives for any question. Hmm. Really. So you, it's yeah, that... what you choose as a motor. Uh, you should have every single case law that you cite with you. You should know the facts of every and the ratio of every single case law. But if you're going to sit to show every single case law, you will never finish your arguments. Um, the practice that I usually follow is that if a judge asks me, I will share a particular case. Otherwise, I refrain from doing so. Jane. Can I just share an anecdote? I also saw one question yeah, as to whether we give it to the other side. Now, in like in real life and court, you obviously hand it over. But sometimes in mooting, what happens is that the propositions are inherently skewed, right? Like for this one, if you're the respondent, it's really tough to explain the delay. It's, it's just like real life that whatever you've been handed to you is what is it. And you have to make your best scenario. So sometimes if you are attempting to hoodwink the judge, now I don't recommend you do this, but in case you are, then don't go around giving the other side a copy. Because once it happened with me where the other side was doing it and they gave us a copy very benevolently and then we just caught them out and the entire round went in the downhill for them. So I think like you just have to be smart about which, like how certain or how good your case law is on your side. I think being like finally being on the other side of mooting, I'm realizing why it's necessary for, your, for the mooters to give a copy of the judgment. Because yeah. it stays with the person. I I see a lot of, but like both of y'all citing stuff, it's very easy to lose y'all. So if it's important, something that's laying down a test, right? I would prefer if either someone would have, see now the point is you cannot tender a judgment to your judges, right? So what you can do instead is just screen share it. Because if someone reads it, it stays with that person longer. So like Priyanshi said, Please don't do it for every single judgment that you're citing. Yeah. It's, you don't have that much time. But definitely, if it's important to your case, do tender it, do screen share. And uh, eventually after that, I mean, once your 
properly mooting and it is an internal mooting you will be preparing your bench memorandums and in that you'll usually include all case laws which are relevant so first the most material points would come there and then like you said like keep it in handy and then if any uh, if the bench requires the entire uh, case law then you should have that ready to share then the next question is could the respondent reiterate on his answer to the ladyship's first question regarding the delay of the order so janet okay so i'll tell you where. should we i think we should just stick to like procedural right okay. yeah yeah i mean i think we can have a conversation about arguments later or uh, both of them can just share their notes no masira why i think maybe a person asked this question is because uh when you look at the proposition we also need certain facts to back up the arguments right mm. so my question was based on that particular fact so if in case anyone was curious with respect to propositions being silent on things the bench sometimes can assume some things to uh you know kind yeah. of uh, favor or not favor a particular argument when that particular fact in the proposition is absent and we ask the council what their views on that absent fact is sometimes so that's the procedural aspect i don't think we need to go into what was actually answered and discussed with respect to that okay then the next one is is there any standard way of going about your submissions uh so there again you will find different answers from different people that you ask um i did, my general and this is what like i feel like when you're mooting you should just do in general is first you should always give like a brief overview of the facts um because the judges may not like they may have just read the problem sometimes they may not have read the problem and you kind of have to contextualize your argument so the logic that i like to follow is fact law application um the other way of doing it is first stating your argument then like laying across the law then going to fact which for me is a little like complicated because why would i lay out the arguments without first contextualizing it in a fact situation um there's no right or wrong way of doing it ultimately you have to be coherent like the judge has to follow what you're saying so whatever works for you and sometimes Just even the one. bank directs you to if like a council starts saying facts a lot of times i've seen that the bank says no i am aware of the facts so like move towards that so like you said it should be coherent and maybe sometimes even at that moment the flow of your arguments might change based on how the bench is receiving it just one more thing like and this is one thing i've learned over time is that always try to prepare a road map of your arguments right so today like what i did is that look petition is in fructuous 1419 now different thing that i didn't get time to come to 19 which was bad on my part in terms of time management but i think once you lay that laid down then even if you don't reach a point the judges in a mood will always know that look there was a consideration at least in your head or that your brain thought of something like that so and they'll know what to expect so sometimes it may be that the, the whole crux of the problem is 19 so the judges will say okay forget the first two things come and deal with 19 first so if you can lay a road map like with your facts then i think that's ideal i think that's so what in the um, yeah. sorry sorry mushira sorry to cut you go ahead yeah i'll continue if you uh, want no i'm just saying that that's a great point because in external moots you will be required to give written submissions you will be required to give like a a, a memoranda which like it is a different story but my point is that um you can always redirect the bench to the arguments in your written submissions if like jana said you're unable to um make them also i see this one question um on chat which is about the shreya singhal case madhav kapoor has asked it and he's saying that did jana know that she was going to use that case um now there are certain landmark cases for certain issues which is why like you know that the other side is going to raise that particular argument but also this would have if if this was an actual moot and if i had and if janay and i had both given written submissions to the court we would have seen our arguments in um, each other's submissions just the last point 
is that whenever you're arguing, it's always mm-hmm. helpful to lay down your arguments that I'll like both of them did it, right? That I'll be arguing on this aspect, that aspect, and that aspect. Mm-hmm. So I can jot it down and then I can see if they're fulfilling those, right? Mm-hmm. Because sometimes when the person <laughs> is arguing, what happens is they like keep jumping around. And because and that's only because so many judges keep asking questions and questions. So they have to go from their first issue to their third issue. And like they sort of forget what issue that they've left out. So then the judge can also point it out to you that, okay, you have satisfied me on your issue one and issue three. But you have said that you would also deal with an issue in respect to blah, blah, blah. And you haven't. Right. So it's always good to like lay that down. And in the sense of the format of argument, I believe that it's always better to like put down a statement of what your conclusion will be. So you can just say that I am this argument will be in relation to this and why such a law would be in this case ultra virus, right? And then you lay down your facts, you lay down your nexus, and then you know you can conclude again that for this and this reason I had stated that. So it's like an entire circle. It's like really well packaged, and then I can be like oh this is what she wanted for uh, to prove yeah. and she's done it with this point and she's done it with this point and then I can I completely tick mark it that oh it goes to the petitioner and the respondents is coming in with their arguments I can just write it beside like this is from a point of view that you know it becomes clearer to a person listening because when you're arguing you're very certain about your arguments you've read the background everything but when someone's listening they have no idea what you're saying so you have to try and make it as simple as clear, as non-technical as it can be so that the other person takes in your argument rather than being, oh, I don't understand what she tried to say and then just leave it raw, right? Can I just say, so I saw this very interesting question where someone brought up that can you only bring in case laws or can you use persuasive arguments? So the thing is that like what I've seen is that generally the best approach is the balanced approach that a case law will do it does its own job of laying down the law like a test or something you cannot make out of logic you will have to refer to that from a case law but certainly when it comes to advancing certain points or when you have to win over a person at the end of the day the judge is also a human being right so you have to target their logic and what they think is right and one more thing that you can do here to push your arguments persuasively is that one question masira kept asking priyanshi was pertaining to the fact about uh, the Tarantino sect, which is a reference to a certain community in our country being uh, demarginalized. So then I saw that maybe if the judge is pushing one point to the other side, you can always make that the cornerstone of your argument. Because that is obviously what the judge is interested in. And maybe that's what they want to hear. And that's why they feel that the, something the other side has done is relevant. So I think you have to certainly keep your ears open as to, because they may drop a little hints here and there as to what they want and what they don't want. So yeah, logic could do its own job there. I don't think it can be a substitute. Also, that's um, also you have to use case law for very specific purposes. So, for example, um, this was something that Jana and I both relied on was and the proportionality test, which is a pro, it, it's basically a four prong test laid for in a judgment called Anuradha Bhasi. Okay, now everybody here, like all four of us, know what the test is. So, if you notice, neither of us really spent any time laying down that, you know, the test says A, B, C, D. But what the judges were more interested in knowing is how it applied to our case. So my case was that we don't fulfill the criteria or the impugned order doesn't fulfill the necessary criteria. And Janai's case was that, no, it does. So for those of you who are listening closely, the entire, like, argument turned on the fact that Janai said that it's the least restrictive measure which is one prong, and I said that it's not the least restrictive measure. So you do rely on case law, but you can also use a lot of other material to make the same point, even with respect to, like, say, discrimination, where you're effectively saying that, look, like the government is effectively saying that, look, there is so much discrimination, there's communal tension that is rampant. (coughs) How on earth am I... How on earth can I possibly do anything less restrictive than this? So it's as long as I said, a fine balance. Um, one other also, question is: What if by chance we cannot answer the judges' questions? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. 
happen to all of us at yeah. some point <laughs> like, it's it's going to happen like the, you do don't like worry about it if you, you can always say i plead my ignorance and it's fine um, as long as you're not pleading ignorance about something that is very very basic law and also i mean definitely you can faff a little bit i mean obviously to an extent okay it's not always and like don't take this to be absolute in any sense but it's not always that the judge knows more okay there are times when they're going to ask you question that even they don't know answers to you can if and obviously this is so subjective to who your judge is what round like if you're in your like prelims and you know if you can understand or oh, the judge is not like well versed and some like ridiculous act that we're talking about not like the con- don't bullshit about the constitution everybody knows the law but uh, if it's something very niche right and you've read so much about it but uh, you you are certain that okay the judge hasn't read so much about it so if you can in in the most you know like subtle manner this is not or you can you know redirect them but do it to an extent don't piss the judge off by saying absolute bullshit where you know they'll catch you try to plead your ignorance as like least as possible right like obviously if it's like a very direct question it has a direct answer and you have no answer to it you can you can say i'll get back to you that's all right and if you have your rebuttals and stuff after that you can actually look for the answer in in your judgments or in the like barracks and stuff and get back to them even in your rebuttals that's all right that still shows that you know you had your material you've gone through it and you could answer you've understood the question but uh, if if it's like very direct then don't bullshit but if you can maneuver around it then try to do it to like the best possible manner that you can right uh, just to add one thing then like this is one thing that i've seen like someone do really badly is don't try to hoodwink somebody also don't give a wrong answer it's better to say look i'm sorry i don't know something you will probably be respected more for that because you know if you work for 3 months on a problem and if you really can't answer a question it certainly means that the question is tough most of the times so that time a simple sorry i can't is better than lying and being caught because then in a round once you've been established that you've lied there's no coming back like it's the biggest fall from grace you see and secondly at times if they ask you a factual question like what shivali did now it's not 100% recommended but you can just take them like say the first point and then take them on another tangent sometimes it may work sometimes you may get thrashed also what you're doing so it again depends on judge to judge as to what it is facts are silent what you can do like this was obviously a maharashtra india sort of uh uh connection right you can take the actual like yeah. statistics facts that's happening in india maharashtra to a limited extent not to the point where you know it like hampers the entire case that oh there's a judgment already passed on it it's been decided and you know so there's nothing this court can do that's that's like stretching it to a ridiculous amount but at the same time if the fact sheet is silent on it and the judge is asking you a question which you might have an answer to in the real sense you can put forth that answer and if your respondent is smart enough or the petitioner is smart enough they may point it out that the fact sheet is silent on this but if they don't then you know you go scot free so it's a win even with respect to the real life examples i think that's also a question which is coming up uh you can always talk about things that are happening in other jurisdictions to supplement your argument it's just a reference and if the judge or the bench does not want to hear it they'll obviously ask you to stop but uh not just to fill in the gaps but also to relate it to any other similar facts uh in any other case i think you can make reference to that as well because someone just ask can you talk about the kashmir issue and yeah you you can as an example uh to because eventually we're just making it as a reference it won't it there's no problem in doing that also uh, like with the kashmir issue just one thing is that you have to be make sure that a lot of fact propositions say nothing more than the fact sheet yeah. so when i'm referring to the kashmir issue i'm giving them context that section 7 of the telegraph act was used therein yeah. in that case so it's not an inference drawn from the fact sheet but it was rather to do with the proposition and this is something like once you do a couple of moots i think you will get to it like these were all questions like we were all incredibly lost the first time we did it 
So yeah, I think that's just. Um, another question is, what are the rules regarding case laws, whether we can use international cases, other high courts or case laws that are very old? So the, uh, okay, so it depends on your fact proposition, first of all. Um, now, for us, we were arguing before the high court, which, and now usually you'll be told that um, the high court of XYZ fictional place is Paris Materia, to say, for example, um, the high court of Bombay, in which case, all judgments rendered by the High Court of Bombay become binding. All judgments rendered by the Supreme Court are obviously binding. But judgments of any other High Courts are persuasive. In an Indian moot context, which was what Jana and I argued, you just don't use international case law because it's not worth it unless there's no Indian case law available. It's a point of law that hasn't been decided by any Indian courts. And it's very unlikely that you'd get something like that. Especially it. in constitutional yeah. uh, propositions. Yeah. I mean, no bench will entertain. Yeah. When, sure. when you have law available in India, then don't. But when you don't, when you don't have it, like, I have seen it in the Bombay High Court that a South African case yeah. has been cited. And it was taken in because it was about POSCO. And we, we were trying to like look at different jurisdiction. But obviously, if there are Indian laws on it, then it becomes absolutely ridiculous because you can cite it and it won't be taken in. So might as well do. Just one last thing. So like very similar to what Masira said, in a moot, once you're arguing whether sedition should be unconstitutional, and they're in the Ugandan Supreme Court, which is also a country which was like India, where we got independence from the British, similar laws and everything. They declared it to be ultra vires. So in those cases, when you're certainly trying to put in a complex proposition of law and you're trying to establish it in this country, certainly you can use it for persuasive value. But then again, let the Indian case laws be the main mainstay. You can use this at best at an ancillary argument. Don't try to really push this as your main case. But yeah, you know, certainly it's good to refer to certain things because jurisprudence is often shared across countries. So there's a lot you can also learn. And then sometimes, if not using it in those words, you can make an argument looking at the same thing in your own words without putting in the case law. So I think you, it shouldn't stop you from looking at that. So I noticed a couple of questions on time. Um, so keep in mind that you will only be given a set amount of time. So I had eight plus two, so eight minutes to make my uh, arguments and then two minutes for a rebuttal. Jana had a clean 10. You're supposed to stick to that time. Indian moods are a little lax with respect to time uh, because, you know, Indian judges are a little more flexible like that. But when if you end up doing international competitions, 15 minutes means 15 minutes. They will count second to second. If you get 10 seconds extra, the other guy will get 10 seconds extra. So when, when you're in a time crunch, which you most certainly will be, you have to prioritize your arguments. Okay. And sometimes the law is the law. You can't change it. You know, if, if I'm arguing uh, freedom of speech and expression, there are a set number of cases that I will argue. There will be a 19-2 argument that I will have to defend. And that's pretty much it. So what really matters is like your delivery, your understanding of the law and your ability to take cases like Shreya Singhal or Anuradha Bhaseen, which run into hundreds of pages and, um, you know, really like make it brief and concise for the judges to understand. Yeah. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions as of now. Um, here's one. Uh, can we cite overturned judgments? No. Straight unless, no. Unless, unless the point of law that you are using it for is not the point of law that's been overturned. Yeah. So okay. You can use a minority view at max to the certain extent that, you know, this was also an applicable view because I think it is w one of like the ZTV judgments have a minority view, which has been cited in so many modes, even though it's it, it's a minority view, but it's still there. And it like, if someone like agrees to it, someone agrees to it. So you can, but please like state it. Huh? Like, please state that it's a minority view. Uh, the judgment as a whole has been overturned, but this point wasn't, things like that. Like if you bring clarity to the judge then he's not going to like think you did not know that and that mm. you've come before this bench without knowing that fact you should just point it out that i know that it has been overturned i know this is a minority view 
I am relying on it for so and so reason only. So then it's clear, and then you can definitely cite it. In fact, uh, Masira, to add to that, a lot of times even the courts rely on overtone judgments in the, with respect to a point of law like Priyanshi said, which is not overtone. So if you feel like you're going for that argument beforehand, then I think you could do a little bit of digging in and see if other courts have also relied on that point of law which you are going to, which has not been overtoned. So I think that just adds to the persuasive value of you relying on that particular uh, judgment for that matter. So I think taking precaution with respect to that, and like she said, be as clear with the bench would probably be your best bet. Also, if there is an overturn judgment and there is a point that has not been overturned, there's a possibility that you will find other judgments. That's that what point. I'm saying. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. That you find other courts which have relied on the not overturned point because they do that often, actually. Also, um, I just got one question. Uh, one second, one that uh, what I was writing a couple of times, so I can just show it to you. I was just frantically making notes on what Priyanshi was saying. So, like, that was just... Uh, so, I, it's all about that you're trying to respond to the other person's points, right? At the end of the day, like, it's a fancy debate where you're trying to make sure that your points stay. So, unless you won't know what the other person is saying, you will not be able to engage with them and make sure that your point works over theirs. So, I think that's... And I think that's what Priyanshi was also writing as well. We were just writing the other person's arguments down. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah. um, it's always good um, and I think I think Jana only mentioned this earlier that it's, it's it's nice to have a roadmap of your arguments so when you say like obviously you'll have like your arguments with your case law and everything but when you're actually in a round I can't oh wait here I can show you guys you should literally like this is what I had written down if you guys can see, <laughs> which is literally just the three arguments the main case law and that's it. You should not be flipping pages in front of the bench. Hmm. Once I got feedback from a judge saying me flipping pages was very violent. So I, I completely agree with what the she says. Don't ask, man. So yeah, yeah I, I especially think... um, now that muting is virtual, because you can hear the mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, yeah. it's so much worse. Because in, in reality, when, when you do it in person, you're at least standing like some distance away. So you can flip how much ever you want. The noise will never bother the judge. But now apparently the noise is also an issue. Also, just one side note, and I think like we can probably conclude after this, is that yeah. when you're like online and this is something I made a mistake in, in this session, that I think at first I was a little faster. But I think that's all, like you'd probably realize that because it's much harder to keep track of how fast or slow you're going online because you don't really see the person there. So like whatever your normal speed of speaking is, just try to go a little slower because it's always better to be like a little slower than faster because the other person may not understand what you're saying. So just take care of your pace, especially when all of y'all are doing pressures because I think that will matter a great deal. Also connectivity issues. I feel like when some people like go fast and then it's such a big issue nowadays. Uh, with respect to virtual hearings. Please I, don't worry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Shari. Just on that no. note, like, don't worry if you have connectivity issues. Like, judges will understand. Like, they won't yeah. shout at you. Yeah. Um, if you, like... I <laughs> mean, high court judges right now are having uh, a connectivity issues. Yeah. I'm a hearing which we attended, like, two, three days back. The connection just went. You can't do anything about it. I mean... Um, so sorry, this they just put one question, yeah, which please never, never, never read like read out like from a piece of paper. It's very apparent, especially virtually, because like you can only see like the speaker's faces. So if my eyes are moving, you will be able to tell that I am reading something off my screen. So please, please, please don't do that. Alternatively, also don't memorize your arguments because if you memorize something, you will be... So it's like this. I have a structure, right? In my head, I give the facts. I make arguments one, two, three. I make my conclusion. Then I come back and I rebut, point, and I rebut points A, B, C that Jana raised, right? That is a fluid format. I have to be flexible because the judges will ask me questions. And if I've memorized my arguments, I will not be able to move left or right, I will not be able to be flexible. So please don't do either. 
Um, one last question we got from YouTube Live is: uh, Do judges really catch you if you by mistake cite incorrect authorities, and what do you do in those situations? See, that's what I said. See, I, I don't always assume that the judge is smarter than you, which is a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. So you can bullshit, but see, whatever we're saying in regards to like the rules and procedure that we follow is to the extent like it's not absolute like this does not uh sort of uh, like every moot is different and this won't be like an like a rule for every moot so you can really see if something like something where you realize that the judge is not like it's a niche piece of like legislature okay something like constitutional law like priyanshi said there are certain judgments that everybody knows about and you really can't bullshit right but there are so firstly when you cite something wrong which is obvious they're going to catch you right away and that also shows like a lack of research on your part because this is something you were supposed to like this is your prep time that you had time to look into something in regards to a question which comes like uh, uh, suddenly and spontaneously is a different issue altogether but if you're going to cite something which is like not right in law that shows a lot on how much you've researched and how like ill prepared you are so always don't like that shouldn't ever come up if like if that happens that's a bad thing but by mistake you've cited it don't if the judges don't point it out don't sort of like you don't point it out saying oh sorry this was not at all on those lines yeah and just one thing like it's okay to misspeak sometimes right like sometimes a word may come out of your mouth again sometimes you may say the same sentence twice that that's fine right that happens and like we're still learning we're still in our fourth year and fifth year like i've seen people who have like in court when i was interning even people with like 30 years of experience have misspoken at times so don't beat yourself over that at all like if that happens that's completely okay and also since this is literally a demo moot i feel like just as a matter of practice uh you should avoid not you should avoid not knowing your case laws you need to know your citations completely like start with since this is the first time you will be starting i think you all should make it a practice to know your case in and out and when you are citing judgments even if it's two know the ratio of it know uh, which court it was in i mean start with the right footing and then use masira's logic which is that judge see how the bench is reacting whether it's a niche point of law and you can see if you can navigate the situation if you've misspoken or you don't know the answer to but as a practice since you're just starting i'd really recommend studying your case laws properly because that a you you place a huge reliance on them during your arguments um i think that's all the questions we have i'd like to thank ms shivali shri vastava and ms masira sheikh for sparing their valuable time for judging this Also, Ms. Priyanshi Vakhari and Mr. Janya Jain for participating and answering all the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Rohan. Thank you, Ruan. Thank you for having us.